Hello. Good morning. Welcome back to Cruising Off Duty. I know we've been gone for a long time. You put a little MIA? Yeah, a little MIA. We've even seeing some comments because the last episode we said we were going to go on a cruise and then we might take a little bit of a hiatus from the channel because I've been producing at least an episode a week for the past three years and I kind of felt like I needed a break. Yeah. So we we're going on this cruise. I said, I don't think we're going to film it. Mm. We might be a little bit of a hiatus on the channel. And then we went black. No, we didn't come back. And so people for were over worried. a month. <laughs> For over a month, we've been gone. And with the coronavirus scare, everybody was like, oh my God, were you quarantined on a ship? Were you one of those no. people? We weren't on a quarantine cruise. Thank God. Yeah, we did actually end up getting chest colds. I brought it with me, caught it from a coworker, and then he caught it even worse. Luckily, coronavirus wasn't a big deal yet, or we yeah. would have been quarantined. Like she didn't really start showing hard symptoms no. until we got on the boat. Yeah. And then she was coughing and hacking and wheezing. And of course, we have to sleep in a really yeah. small, confined room. So within a short amount of time, I mm -hmm. caught it. Now, this was January 15th to around the 28th. Mm -hmm. We never even heard about the coronavirus no. when we got on the boat. And then when you're on a cruise ship, you don't really have internet unless you pay, you know, pretty yeah. big dollars to have internet on the boat. Uh, so we didn't hear about coronavirus till we got off the boat. Exactly. And so, then I'm glad we didn't yeah. know about it or that the cruise ship wasn't too concerned about it yes. because we would have been quarantined for sure because yeah. we were... Both of us sounded like... When you like breathe, when I was breathing, I could hear bubbles. Like, yeah. there was so much fluid in there. Yeah, exactly. And uh, we did cruises mostly to go scuba diving at different locations. And we did three scuba diving things. And the, the end, yeah. third one, I almost canceled myself out because the night before I had so much trouble breathing in my cabin because of the, all the fluid in my lungs. So I guarantee you the cruise ship would have quarantined us if they had the coronavirus been a thing. Like then we got off and we were trying to go fly home. And then we saw people walking around like, usually... Yeah. You sometimes see Asian people wearing masks. It's sort of their cultural thing. When they get off a plane or they're getting in a public place, they might wear a mask. But we were seeing a lot of people wearing a lot masks. of people wearing masks, and we were like, "What's going on?" And we're reading our phone for the first time, and coronavirus here, coronavirus there, and and then we got home, and then we heard about that Diamond Princess boat yeah. that they quarantined, and I guess 692 people. Something. That's the, the number I saw. 692 people got the coronavirus. Mostly because they most were, of them caught it during the quarantine. So yeah, so they, probably if they just had been a normal okay. cruise and they just let people off, it might have been ten people that had coronavirus, but they were worried about the contagion, yada yada. So they kept everybody on the boat, and that just doomed all those people to be stuck on a boat. And let's face it, in our cruise ship too, yeah. there's one air duct that blows air into your room, which I means that's air that's coming from other parts of the ship. So you're quarantined it's in the room. It's an airborne room. thing. So yeah, it's an airborne it's disease. <laughs> so, anyways. Yeah. This is not a coronavirus video. Yeah, this but, isn't the coronavirus episode. But we just wanted to show the you coronavirus. We're um, fine. Yeah. Yeah. And there's a and the reason we went dark for so long is we didn't really enjoy this cruise too much. No. Uh, we said we probably wouldn't film it, but we thought we might a little yeah. bit and do one episode, but we didn't enjoy this cruise. No. Nope. So we we didn't film things with the intention of producing an episode and yeah. Uh, Cuz we would have been a bitch fest. It would have been one a, of those things where we, we go, we don't yeah, like this we, boat. We'll, we'll do our or... review of that some other time. Yeah. You go yeah. on and on. We're going to do a live uh, episode probably oh, right after we, okay. this. Well, oh, not, yeah, not sure. today, but okay. <laughs> the next few days because people tend to like it. Plus, they might want to ask questions about the real topic that we're here to talk about, which is um, I've thought for a while, and Janice has uh, believed this as well, that the markets, the stock market, yeah. everything is at bubble, super inflated prices, uh, mostly because the the federal banks of the world, Japan, the EU, and the United States, probably Canada, where we live as well, have been printing money like drunken sailors and just pumping that into the economy to try and keep what would have been a recession by now from happening. Yeah. But unfortunately... Like for those who don't know, he's actually a brainy guy and he has a commerce degree. So we yeah. actually are really... Yeah. He's really into this. I'm really into this. Yeah. I go to bed listening to business yeah. podcasts in earbuds as I sleep. So. Yes. It's all, all the... Yeah. It's all yeah. that. All so that. if you want to know more, because I don't want to go into great details about why this financial collapse is happening. If you agree with this already, I don't need to sell you on this. Uh, but if you want to know a lot more, of course, there's a bunch of business podcasts. But one of those business podcasts um, that I listen to regularly brought on a guest who has a YouTube channel. And this podcast host was just raving about this YouTube channel. And uh, I said, I, you know, I want to learn more about this guy because it's a video, video perspective where he shows kind of a whiteboard and talks about different topics. He's really good. His name is George yeah. Gannon. And he is amazing. Like he makes it entertaining. He keeps his whiteboard videos about certain topics to about 10 minutes, which is a nice, short, manageable amount of video to watch. And man, he has the stats, he has the backup. And now that his channel has grown, it's only been around for, I guess, less than a year. He started off as more of a real estate kind of flipper kind of channel, and now he's turned into more of a macroeconomic channel. 
But he brings on all sorts of really amazing guests now and does more hour-long videos, which he turns into podcasts. So if you want to listen to him, you, he has a podcast. If you want to watch him, which is what I suggest, because visual way is, is an easier way to learn. His channel is just called George Gannon. Um, his, when he gets on the video, he calls it the Rebel Capitalist Show. So anyways, check him out. I'm going to throw a video clip on here. I contacted him and he gave me permission to throw a short clip of his kind of style of presenting a topic. And I think you'll find it really engaging. And also, you'll learn a lot. If you don't already think a financial collapse is coming, watch his channel. And then write in the comments. If you already thought there was one coming, you can say, I didn't need to watch it. I already believe you. If you're not of one of those believers and you think the market's just going to keep on going to stratospheric highs from here, um, check out his channel first and then write below that you checked out his channel. And if you still believe that the good times are going to keep on rolling, say that in the comments as well. So maybe when we do our live thing, we can talk about, we can talk about it in more detail, but I'll throw that clip up now. Yeah. Banks are failing and you are going to bail them out. I'm going to explain this to you in three simple, fast steps. Step number one. Let's start with the bank that everybody is talking about right now, HSBC. It came out in the news lately that they are cutting 35,000 jobs. They took a $7.3 billion write down, which they call a goodwill impairment. You may be asking yourself, George, what on earth is a goodwill impairment? That's when you go out and buy a home in 2006 for a million dollars. And then in 2009, you realize, whoops, that house is worth about $50,000. The difference between the million that you paid for it and the 50,000 that your house is actually worth is a goodwill impairment. $4.65 billion loss just in Europe. And I want to point out that HSBC has all their eggs in one basket. What I mean by that, 50% of their revenue comes from Asia. And Asia represents 90% of their total pre-tax profit. Insert the... Which of course I cannot say or this YouTube video will be... So we'll call it the Cerveza Sickness. China is the starting point for the majority of the supply chains throughout the world. So manufacturer A supplies parts to a corporation, we'll call that corporation B in India, which uses those parts to create an end product. Likewise with corporation C in Europe. HSBC might have loans to all three of these corporations on their balance sheet. If something goes haywire, like the Cerveza sickness, in China and shuts everything down right here, that means that Indian corporation and the European corporation aren't going to be able to pay back their loans. That creates this Jenga style balance sheet for HSBC where if that bottom block, which is China, goes, the entire thing comes crashing down along with all of HSBC's revenue, or at least 90% of their profit. Okay, so now you've had a little taste test of the George Gannon channel, the rebel capitalist. I highly suggest you see it if you were like thinking things are great and the good times are gonna keep rolling. His channel might convince you otherwise. So. Now, this is something I've already believed well before I read or watched his channel that I thought a collapse was coming. Yeah. Um, now, I've been saying that for a while. Yeah, I've been <laughs> saying it for a while. It was a little early. I sort of liquidated our stocks a little too early, but uh, moved us into gold and, and gold uh, royalty companies that give you a, a dividend, which is kind of a nice, safe way to play gold companies. That would be uh, Royal Gold and Franco Nevada are my two big ones. And then I bought a bunch of junior, um, junior production companies. Um, anyways, and I also have a bunch of silver coins. That's another way we protected ourselves from years ago. Yeah. Before the 2008 collapse, I felt things were getting a little like mm, a little crazy here, and uh, I started buying silver coins. That was my yeah. way of what if the economy collapsed and literally money meant nothing. Like Venezuela. Think of Venezuela, where you know it's just thousand percent inflation, ten thousand percent inflation. Where you walk into a store or a restaurant and it's going to cost you fifty dollars for a meal, and by the time you get the bill, it's 
$250 for the meal. I mean, that's how fast the inflation was. If it gets to the point where money means nothing, it's just paper, then you have to have other ways to barter and exchange uh, value for things. So I started buying silver coins. So what I did was back when silver was like $7 an ounce, I'd go on eBay and I would buy a state sale silver. People that had silver coins, um, literally bags of them, and they were selling them almost at the spot price of silver. Well, you'd auction. It would be an auction. So on eBay, you'd bid and hope to get it. And if it was at around the price of uh, silver, which was about $7 at the time, I'd buy chunks of silver coins. And I've held on to them ever since. So went through the recession. And actually, when I bought at 7, it went all the way to 40 for silver. And then it went all the way back down. <laughs> so I wrote it up and back down, but I still have them. So that's sort of what we've done for our investments. And the reason we just, I know people would say you have only gold stocks. Well, the reason I did that, you should really only have about 10 to 15% of your net worth in, in a safe haven like gold or gold stocks. The reason that we don't have, that sounds like a lot that we have all of our investments in that, but the reason is our pensions are yeah, the rest of our investments. Yeah. yeah. So I have an Omer's pension, which is an Ontario Municipal Employees Pension. She has a federal government of Canada pension. Yeah. Mine's probably a little more safer than yours. Oh, yeah. Okay. My rate of return is very low. Like they're not doing a very good job, and they're always talking about how they they're going to be short. So new hires uh, now, yeah. are, their retirement date is five years older than mine. Right. So they're incre they can't increase mine, but anybody new coming in, they do increase. And you know, it is the Trudeau government. Anybody who's Canadian is aware of how much money they waste and give away billions, yeah. just wasted, and their debt has just you know got up so high that I do not trust them with my money. Like his father had pillaged the pension fund, the Canada pension fund in the past. And I wouldn't be surprised if they tried yeah. that again with ours. Um, so I want to get my money out there. I'll be under 50 when I retire. So I'm eligible to take a transfer value in lieu of pension, which then I'll be forced to invest anyway, but at least I get to control it. And yeah, we can put it in something safe. Can be yeah. In charge. yeah, so long and short, hers is, I think the federal government's yeah. more of a, we've got the money, trust us, it'll be there. No. <laughs> which if she doesn't obviously trust them. No. Mine's uh, like a like the teacher's pension fund or anything. Omer's is is they take the money out of your uh, paycheck every month, and the city of Ottawa, who I work for, pits, puts money into the pension as well. And then that money is invested in things like real estate, uh, resorts, bonds, stocks. They broadly diversified. So I'm already exposed to the normal economy. I can't control that. That's my pension. So mm -hmm. if this collapse happens that I expect to happen, it's not a matter of if it's a matter of when, in my mind, it might be next year, it might be this year, it might be three years from now. We're planning to retire in four years. We're, so we're uh, hoping it happens now. Yeah. In a way, in a way, it's it's we're hard to say. It. Because in a way, what it comes down to, if this collapse happens right when we're ready to go, that could be bad, it could be good. Because what happens is if the, our house, which is our biggest asset outside of our pension, drops 20%, but catamarans on the used market drop 80%, then we actually benefited. Yeah. And the last recession, we should tell them about the last recession. Yes. The last recession, the Canadian dollar went back to par, which yeah. right now where it's about exactly. 1.33. Uh, we put, have to put a dollar 33 in Canadian to get $1 American. And back in 2010, when we bought a boat, it was par because of the recession that was going yeah. on. So talk about what we experienced during the last recession. So we went on our boat shopping trip. We had decided what kind of boat we wanted because the marina we were at had a maximum footage of 36. So... He really wanted a Veneto. I'm like, okay, well, 35, we're going to get the biggest one that we can have at that club. We picked a few. They were North Carolina, you know, all over the place, a couple of them in Florida. And they were all the same exact model. Yeah, yeah same exact model within a year or two. Um, so our trip to Florida, uh, looking at boats there, with the one we looked at, I didn't want because it had bolts inside. And uh, I wasn't going to uh, be, re I didn't want that problem. But So we said, no, thank you. And as we're walking away, the guy chased Craig and was like, oh, the bank just wants us gone. Just make any offer. Any offer. Any offer, no matter how low. And I said, like, like 30000 That Do I, we get the boat? He goes, M probably. <laughs> he was like, literally, just give me any. He was begging yeah. me as I was leaving to give him any offer. So I turned to her and I'm like, you know, we could probably clean the no. mold. And we could probably, we could, we could get this thing for. It'll always come back. I'm not and doing that. Anyway, she would not hear of it. <laughs> so she was like, no. So we had to walk away from what would have been a sweet deal. But the other thing that we saw, too, on the way to that marina in Naples, Florida, yeah. the, is one of those man-made peninsula type of neighborhoods where there's oh, water on both house. sides. Of the road, as you drive down there, both sides of the water, uh, both sides of the road have waterfront property. Um, every second, if not it was two, two out, out of three, three, it was two out of three. I either had another one, another one, four another rent one. signs or for sale yeah. signs on the lawn. I mean, every, and we're driving down this road, and it's just nonstop <clears throat> yeah. for sale signs. And we signs. stupidly didn't buy some because we heard people that did yeah. made a lot of money when that yeah. market went back up. Again. Right. 
Should so, have bought some. Maybe, but we wouldn't have the money for the boat then. No. Then we wouldn't have this channel then. We could have buy. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> we got a lot of money though. <laughs> yeah. But that's what I say. When recessions or in what could be in this case a depression comes, um, things that aren't necessary to your everyday life drop more than your home. Yes. A single family home in a nice neighborhood that is not inflated, like San Francisco is inflated. Uh, Vancouver. Vancouver, Canada is one of the most overpriced places in the world. I think it's number two in the world in terms of what the cost of a single family home is compared to the average salary of that area. It's that overpriced that it's number two behind Hong Kong. That's how crazy it is in Vancouver. So if you're in Vancouver, while the good times are going, maybe it's time if you are near retirement to think about selling and maybe finding a place to rent until you want to move or whatever. Something to think about. Toronto is also um, a bit overpriced. Not as much as Vancouver, but Toronto's a... Ottawa is not as, luckily for us, is stable. Mm -hmm. It's the capital of Canada. So it's got the federal government as a backbone to the economy. And then we're also what's called Silicon Valley North. Uh, we are the Silicon Valley of Canada. So all around where we live, it's just high tech company after high tech company after high tech company. Now, granted, in a really deep recession, some of those country, country, uh, companies will be affected and they will lay off people and stuff. So our house will drop in value. But the, because the federal government will probably still be there printing money and spending like drunken sailors, um, they'll keep those employees around. Um, so our house probably won't drop as much. So what it comes down to is timing. It's not if, it's when is this recession or this depression going to come and how can you how can you protect Prepare. yourself? What we've done is we've got a lot of gold uh, company investments, gold royalty companies. I own a lot of silver coins. Those are the what if the economy completely collapses type of barter system. Um, that's what we've done. Yeah. Of course, we are like I said, we're already going to, without our choice, be affected by any stock market crash. So we will be affected. It's just a matter of how do you minimize the pain? Yeah, so I'm working on eliminating debt. We want zero yeah. debt. She's working two jobs to eliminate yeah. any debt that she has, like some line of credits that she's cleaned up. It's great. Yeah. So we just have our, our mortgage now, and then when that's done, we I are debt-free. I still have money. I still have debt. Do you? Oh, she has debt that I don't know about that. <laughs> <laughs> but she's working two jobs to get rid of it. So, yeah, get rid of your debt. Be ready. Have a good chunk of safety money ready and prop probably should try and get yourself invested. If you've got just money sitting in, in a savings account, try and put it in silver coins or gold coins or something that will have value. Now talking about gold, think of it as an insurance policy. I'm not even saying gold's gonna go to $20,000 an ounce. I'm just saying that it will hold its value more than paper currency. Fiat currency is really just money printed that says we trust us, we, this, we're good for this money and it's just a piece of paper. So if the economy collapses and the government keep, tries to get out of it by printing more and more dollars, the U.S. government is printing so much money, it's crazy. I mean, it makes Canada look like we're actually being somewhat fiscally responsible. And we, of course, we aren't. It's just the U.S. is like going overboard bonds. with it. The U.S. government will issue a bond and the federal, nobody will buy it at the low interest rates that they're having. Um, so the federal government comes in or the Fed, Federal Reserve comes in and buys the bonds for the government to keep the interest rates down. They got to keep those interest rates down because the U.S. government has so much debt i think something like 23 trillion dollars anyways so much and they're doing a trillion dollars a year additional debt and that's the deficit that's that they're telling us if those numbers are even real and they always try and make the numbers fudge, look, fudge the numbers in their favor um prime example the real inflation rate is probably about 10 percent. the way they did inflation calculations back in the 70s was a different way a different formula they included food mm -hmm. they included energy they included all these things. And if we use those same, that same formula to say what today's inflation rate is, it'd be about 10%. But the government doesn't want to admit it's 10% no. because if then- If they admitted that, they'd have to give me and all my coworkers- Everybody want to raise, 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 yeah. <laughs> and all those people on pensions where they're indexed to inflation, they'd have to pay all those pensioners a 10% increase every year. So yeah. they don't want to admit that. So what they do is they get rid of things like food and energy, which is your electric bill, your you, you know your gas for your car, all that's not counted, even though in everybody's day-to-day -day life. That's what's eating up. What do you spend your money on? You spend it on food, you spend it on fuel, you spend it on heat for your Utilities. house. Utilities. And healthcare. There's another one that they don't they don't claim. So then the CPI is now two percent or a little bit above. And then in the US, they decided they did they kept saying they want to get inflation to two percent. Well, inflation's above that, even by their fake numbers. So now they're starting to call this new thing called PCE. It's not even the CPI anymore. They're using a thing called PCE, which is even fudged even more. And now it says 1.8. And again, they just play with the numbers because they want to, well, all politicians want to get 
uh, reelected. reelected. So, like you said, they want to make the good times sound look like the good times are rolling. And Trump says this all the time: best economy in the history of man. And I know it's just it's like it's just insane. But long and short, the numbers are fudged. Um, the SARS numbers from China, oh, or SARS, the Corona numbers yeah. from uh, China. China are fake. Uh, they're under saying how many people have it. When people die, if they can come up yeah. with any other reason other than coronavirus, they'll account for it as being some other yeah. kind of death just to keep the numbers down. That yeah. coronavirus is spreading. Because um, I read an article that, that the way that Chinese has, the Ch that China has managed this coronavirus is similar to how the Soviet Union managed the Chernobyl disaster. Uh, just De deny, deny, deny. Just cover it up, yeah. mask it, pretend it didn't, it's not so bad. And that resulted in the collapse of the Soviet Union because everybody lost faith in that. Yeah. So that happens to China. I mean... That could be a yeah have a big impact yeah. on the economy. The, the Chinese government has to print money because they peg their dollar to the U.S. dollar, and if their economy is collapsing because of this, they have to print Chinese yuan to keep the peg going. I mean, it's just an insane amount of everybody's printing money. The EU is printing money. Everybody's printing money. Everybody's fighting to get their interest rates as low as possible. Yeah. it's insane that everybody's doing the same thing. It's a big house of cards. It's almost like a Ponzi scheme where they print money to pay somebody they owe, and then that per, you know it's just print, 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 print. Well, eventually, people come to the realization, which is what I'm trying to tell you, that you can't print money in perpetuity before the money has absolutely no value, and you become the next Venezuela. Um, the only reason the U.S. government, uh, the, the dollar is so strong is because everybody else is doing the same thing, and everybody's fleeing to the U.S. dollar because it's the world ex you know exchange currency, and it's perceived as safer than, let's say, the Japanese yen or the Chinese yuan or the, even the EU, uh, the euro dollar. So because of that, the US dollar seems like the cleanest shirt in a dirty shirt pile. Like it's not that it's clean, it's that it's less dirty than the other ones. So yeah. So anyways, we'll see. The coronavirus could be that black swan event that sort of pu push, puts the pin in that bubble and finally collapses things because the Chinese economy before this was the number two mm -hmm. world economy mm -hmm. and they supply all the parts that other countries manufacture. Like Germany is big known for all their cars, but a lot of the parts that go into their cars come from China. Yeah. So they have to slow down their production because they can't get the parts to well, go like into Well, like Apple's in China. Yeah, and Apple. Tesla's now in China. Yeah, uh, Apple warned <laughs> that they're closing up, they're, they're yeah. gonna miss their numbers this quarter because they can't produce the phones that they're supposed to produce because mm -hmm. they produce their phones in China. So, it's it's bad, it's really, really bad. So, so he wants to have a live episode in yeah. the future. People that are interested in this subject um, yeah, with you for the too. purpose of uh, retirement planning. Yeah. And Talk about whether you agree, especially after you yeah. watch some of the things I've suggested, whether you agree a collapse is coming. We can talk about it there. We'll, we'll get on here. We can talk about anything, really. We can talk about mm -hmm. our time frame, whether it's changed because of this, uh, what kind of votes we're thinking of getting, what we would do if there was a collapse, whether we would just do the best we can, sell our house for whatever it's worth and still do the boat thing or not. Like We could do a live episode where it'd be a little more back and forth. So there you go. Yeah. All right. So that's it for now. Just be forewarned. This is our thoughts on things. Tell us in the comments below whether you agree there's a collapse coming for sure or whether you think that good times are going to keep on rolling in the longest bull market in history. So I'm interested to see what you think. Until next time, this is Craig. And Janice. Signing off, wishing you safe cruising and ciao for now.